name is Darren St. George. Welcome to Sal St. George's virtual road trip to the uh, Laurel and Hardy Museum. Now, every Monday morning, we celebrate entertainment's leaders, legends, and icons, and it is an honor to have you with us. Uh, next Monday, we are going to the Clark Gable Museum, so please be sure to join and sign up for that. We're going to have a great time. We always have John Higgins with us behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smoothly, and there is certainly a lot to do today, as I see we're already over 150 guests, so it's so thrilling to see you all turn out for Laurel and Hardy. This is wonderful. Um, if you could, at this time, one, one last time, please make sure to have your microphones and your cameras turned off. If you have any questions that pop up during the program, please use it. Use the chat. Let us know. We love hearing from you. We love hearing the information. S share your thoughts uh, with us in the chat. If you're over on Facebook, we're watching there as well. Feel free to use the chat, and we'll relay your questions over to Sal. So at this time, let's get the man of the hour in. Sal, Dad, are you there? Here we go, turning it on. Good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning, Pop. How are you doing? I got to tell you, I am so thrilled. Uh, by the time you said we have 150 people, it's already up to 165 people. We have several guests from London, from the UK. Um, this is wonderful. We're really thrilled that you're, being, you're with us today. And uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, from... What I know about Long and Hardy, Stan would be very appreciative of it. He would never believe that all these years later, Laurel and Hardy would be as popular as they are. And why don't we bring the museum okay. in right oh, now? Well, here, Pop, before we got started with that, I wanted to follow up from one of our last programs when we were talking about Tody Fields. Tody Fields, a famous comedian from the 1950s and 60s. Uh, we did her as part of our famous women of uh, comedy. And uh, during the course of our conversation, it turned out that several guests mentioned Tody Fields had a special recipe uh, that they were making for uh, their friends and family. And Darren pursued that recipe Got it, and here he's going to show you what happened. Yes, so um, we <laughs> it's called Toady Fields Heavenly Frozen Salad. That's what it's called, and this is this is what it looks like. So it is one. It's about two pounds of fruit cocktail, a pint of sour cream, and almost a pound of miniature marshmallows. So uh, I gave the um, recipe to my wife. She gave it a shot and we took some pictures. You can see it's frozen. It is frozen. You have to put all this together and then take it out 10 minutes before serving. And they recommend you serve it on salad or you serve it up. So we put it in some uh, tall glasses. We even had some friends over, some <laughs> brave intrepid friends who were willing to give it a shot with us. So here we are, as we're about to take it, very excited. And uh, <laughs> it, it's definitely unique for us. And here we go. Let's, <laughs> we gave it a shot and had some, um, some interesting thoughts, some interesting thoughts. How, big, how was it? The big impression, we surprisingly loved it. We really did. It's something unique. It's different. We had never had it before. And I can see how this is a nice dessert. It's really refreshing. Darren, so I just I threw, would I, recommend that if anybody here wants that recipe, we should send it out to them. Okay, we'll share it. We'll share it again. We'll share it again. Yeah, it's Toady Fields Heavenly Frozen Salad. It's also uh, known as a Bavarian Bavarian uh, dessert or a frozen Bavarian, something like that as well. It was another name. My mom yeah. made it and called it Bavarian Fruit Cocktail. There it is. Thank you, Gail. Yes. Oh, Ambrosia. That was the question. I don't know Ambrosia well. Is this just Ambrosia? Is this what Ambrosia is when they talk about it in Southern movies? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's that's it for us. I wanted to follow up and let you know all that we tried it. And we'll share the recipe one last time for all of you 43% uh, who are looking to try it. So I'm glad to see that. <laughs> and from the minute you said it was 150, we're up to almost 190 right now. Wow, so, that's wonderful. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you this Katie Monday morning. Here. Let's get the uh, Laurel and Hardy Museum in and let's get started with this. I am so excited uh, to see what Katie has for us. Hi, Katie. Hello, how are you doing? Good morning. Katie, how did you get involved with this museum? Okay, so um, when I was graduating from my master's program, I came back home to um, Grovetown, 
which is the next city over from Harlem. And I began, um, cause I graduated with a master's in anthropology and, um, well, I did began you know anything about Laurel and Hardy. I didn't at that time. Um, my master's was actually in religions and, and the culture that, um, went with them. But I began applying for curation positions at the museums in the area. And um, they were about to move the museum from its old location to its current location. And they were looking for a curator. I have learned a awful lot since then. <laughs> How long have you been with them? Um, I have been with them since August of 2018. No, 2019. Okay. All right, so um, the reason the museum is where it is located is because Oliver Hardy was born there. That is correct. Okay, and is his home still there, or is it... Uh... Um, no, it's not. Um, as w w I'm actually standing right here in front of our early years section, um, where we talk about how the early years of both Laurel and Hardy um, for Hardy, his early years begin um, here in Harlem, but um, very early on within that first year, his father dies when he's 10 months old. And um, the following year, his godfather dies. And he, um, at that point, his mom takes him and the rest of the family um, first to Madison and then where her people are. And then she hops a couple of places and ends up in Milledgeville here in Georgia where she um, runs the hotel. At which point that's all the performers go through that hotel, which is how he's introduced to actor. Aha. Uh -huh. So what was the name of the hotel? It is, hold on, I've got it written down right here because um the baldwin hotel okay so act it was an actor's um pit stop they would go there stay at the hotel and then go to the local vaudeville houses or whatever and do their or, program. Right, right vaudeville houses theaters um etc and what and was, he what, yeah what was his because i know he had a beautiful singing voice uh was he using it in those days um, as a child, yes, it's actually one of the ways, because he was actually a very bullied child because of his size and he actually gained acceptance through his singing, uh, um, with his peers. Mm -hmm. Now, Laurel, on the other hand, was born in Ulverston, England. Um, and he always had, um, a tie to the arts because his dad was a theater manager and his mom was an actress. Right. And from what I remember, we just did a story about Charlie Chaplin. He was uh, Charlie's understudy uh, when he was part of the Carnot group. And when they came to America from England, uh, that's when Stan and Charlie both came to uh, America. That's correct. And actually we talked about that right over here. Okay, let's go. Um, in this section here, um, that's um, Laurel's. We also talked about Hardy's early career right over there. And we have um, a section, this case right here actually has a portion about their lives. Um, Can we see the case? Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, we have a hard time uh, reading any of those things, but the pictures we can see. So okay. um, that picture with Stan Laurel and the really skinny guy, that's actually Hardy in his last two years when he actually started taking care of himself. Um, the lady in the picture that has the writing on it, that's actually Stan's daughter. Um, and she's still with us, isn't she? No, actually, she, she passed in uh, 2018. Ah, okay. Um, she was here until recently. Um, 
So, and then of course you, we have some of Hardy stuff. This final picture over here is actually Hardy with John Wayne. They were Masonic brothers and they did one picture together, but Hardy got permission from Stan to do it because they did nothing when they were a duo that each other did not um, uh, give permission for, except for one time. And that was when um, Hardy was still under contract to Hal Roach, but Laurel had completed his contract. Right. And uh, that was what Hal Roach was using against them because they both had separate contracts. Stan said, I'm going to wait and uh, this way we can negotiate both of our contracts at the same time. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. But in time, Hardy was forced to do a, a few more pictures for Hal Roach because mm -hmm. his contract was not up. It right. did come of a, a, a rift between them for a short time um, because Hardy was forced to make those pictures because he couldn't get out of the contract without it. Yeah, I think I, I might be mistaken. Uh, didn't uh, Ollie make movies with Harry Langdon, the um, the uh, silent film comedian? I believe so. Yeah, um, they were trying they, to replace they Stan. Were Hardy's favorite, and he he literally did them so he could finish up his contract, and then he and Stan well, could get back. Excuse me. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I I only see you, uh, Mr. St. George. How do I get to see the museum and the lady who's talking? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Here, I, I can help you. Um, Just at the top right-hand corner, make sure you hit grid view. It says view. Make sure you hit select grid view or gallery view. That's it. Gallery okay, thank view. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> sorry. Now return to your usual scheduled programming. <laughs> hey, Katie. Okay, what? where was I? Uh, we were talking about the um, difficulty that Ollie had because of the um, the contract with Hal Roach. Yes. So, but after that, um, he um, they got back together and they were able to smooth things out fairly quickly. Now, one of the things that, um, and we'll come back, we'll come over here to our. Um, uh, section of talking about them when they're a duo. And here we have actual canisters of actual films. And they're and so um but now from what I understand um <laughs> Stan was actually the uh brains of the operation. He was the one that uh, worked on the set and worked on the scripts and worked on the gags. And Ollie was um, the golfer. He would come in and uh, Stan would say, we're doing X, Y, and Z. Ollie would say, okay. And that's how they worked. There, that is true. When Stan was still a um, singleton, when he was had his very, very first... Um, single show when he was still a teenager he actually came up with the bowler hat bit and at his first show at the panopticon in in the uk and um that it was such a success that that's one of the things that he carried through and it's one of the things that he introduced with his bit with ollie um was the bowler hats mm -hmm. um he was also a, a prolific screenwriter um, not only for him and Ollie, but for many other comedians. And even after Ollie died, he never performed again, but he continued to screenwrite. Yeah, from what I understand, um, Jerry Lewis offered him a huge contract to be his technical advisor on movies, and uh, he turned it down. Yeah, he just... The only thing he continued after Ollie's death was the screenwriting. He did. He no longer directed or performed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and they they actually performed up to about two years before, prior to Ollie's death. Was that the uh, London tour we're talking about? Yes, that is the European tour. Yeah. 
And that was the uh, tour that the movie was based on? Yes. So. Um, how, how accurate is that motion picture? It's. The one thing I like about that movie is it portrays the fact that um, they really were like brothers. They really had a, a profound um, love for one, a platonic love for one another. They, um, they stayed with one another through thick and thin. They really were family. Yeah, we're talking about the motion picture Stan and Ollie, if you haven't seen it. Correct. Um, yes. Correct. Um, they had actually the one thing I dislike about it is they the the rift the quote unquote rift that they talk about was much more short lived, and um, had already been repaired by then. Yeah, you know they were together for so many years. It's hard to imagine them. Uh, they weren't a Martin and Lewis. They really did have an affection for one another. They did. They loved one another deeply as as literally as siblings. And so you're going to have some rough patches here and there, but they were the rift that they showed was much more short lived and much easier going than what they portrayed in the movie. Uh, but they did show that kind of sibling love that they had. Um, there was another motion picture. It came out of, um, I think the BBC made it. It was only an hour long called Stan. Are you familiar with that one? I am not. Okay. Um, so I'll have to, I'll go, I'll have to go and watch that one. See. Great performances, great story. And it's really about the last days of Ollie and, uh, very emotional. It'll really choke you up at, at times but it does show their affection for one another. So one of the great things I love about their story is they actually became a duo accidentally. Um, so they actually, their very first film together was actually about five to six years before um, they actually became a duo. In 1921, they did a film called The Lucky Dog. Ollie was not even supposed to be in that film. And he, uh, the person who was who play was supposed to play Ollie's part, didn't show up. Just didn't show up to the set that day, and so they grabbed Ollie off the lot and threw him in that part. Now, in that particular movie, they did not play a duo; they were antagonists. Yeah, I think Ollie was playing the heavy in the film. Yep, he was playing the heavy in that film, and. Uh, <clears throat> It was also before panachromatic film. And so you'll see in that film, Stan's eyes look pure white. It doesn't look like he has an iris at all because that was during before panachromatic film. And so the, the actors with the blue, blue, blue eyes, all of their eyes look really white. And... Um, like they have no irises It really creeped audiences out. So they didn't get much on camera time because they tried different things to try and make it better and it only made it worse. So when panachromatic film came out, that's when I, actors with blue eyes finally got film time. Katie, how long has your museum been there? Okay. So the, Laurel and Hardy portion has been in Harlem for just over 20 years. Um, but we moved, um, we opened this location October of 2019. Oh, because, wow. yeah. What happened was, is we actually needed a bigger location for what we had. And so when we moved down here, then um, we also opened it up. So there's this portion that we're in right now on the interior that is all Laurel and Hardy. On the exterior of what you of these partition walls that we're going around right now is a history portion of the of Harlem. Um, can we see a little bit more? I see there's more displays behind you. Yep. So we're getting ready to come around here. 
So what we have here on this side is what we call our cultural effect. And we do displays of various types. Um, right now we've got some cars, but primarily in our cases, we have what we call our mugs display. And we have mugs of various types, including the Toby mugs that you could make at home with the um, molds that we have. We have um, the regular face mugs. We have even a cookie jar. We have um, steins like they have in Germany where you flip the top off with your thumb. Um, we even have at the very far corner, um, we have a handmade clay mug. We also have um, a Garfield and Odie mug that has the bowler hats. Yeah, can we get a little closer to these? They look gorgeous. Wow, very nice. We have a very inquisitive audience. They want to see everything, every uh, every nuance. We're trying. We were trying to get the camera flipped around for us uh, so we could show the case this better. But I can't see what I'm showing you all. So if I'm not close <laughs> enough, y'all just need to need a shout out. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, so in this case over here, what we have is our, our Sons of the Desert display. And Sons of the Desert is the international fan club for um, Laurel and Hardy. And they have what they call tents or birthmark tents all over the world. The Sons of the Desert. Yep. Sons of the Desert. It is named after the movie that they did called Sons of the Desert. Um, we also have a, that yeah. section right there that she's showing you is um, Stan Laurel always wrote his fans back, but he always typed the um, letters because his handwriting was so poor. So he would type the letters and then sign his name at the bottom. So, but yeah, oh, this there is you go. Now you got it. Hey, I'm trying here. Sorry. That's okay. It looks great. So, but we only keep about 25% of our, if that, of our items on display. Oh, can you back up? I want to see that Sons of the Desert poster that you just had. There it is. There you go. Great shot of them. We have a survey on the screen right now, and we're asking everyone to name their favorite Laurel and Hardy movie. Um, Darren, you want to take it away? Yeah, you bet. It looks so the options we gave were The Music Box, Sons of the Desert, Way Out West, and Blockheads. And clearly, we have a winner here with Sons of the Desert at 40%. 40%. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's too surprising. The Music Box and Way Out West are pretty close. You know, there are a few votes separating those two, but then Blockheads didn't do too well. Only 10% went to Blockheads. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, so. You know, I tend to think that because of the volume of work that Laurel and Hardy uh, did, how many movies they did, people don't really know the titles of those films. I, I think they, they remember scenes, but they don't remember the exact uh, film. Oh, but we do have a write-in ballot for Babes in Toyland, and that's a great uh -huh. holiday favorite. Yeah, we watch that one a lot. Yeah. So we actually have posters for Babes in Toyland. Hey. hey there we go. <laughs> do you, um, Katie, do you know anything about the making of that motion picture? Um, I, I we don't know as much about Babes in Toyland, but what we do know about is um, we have... Uh, the Wizard of Oz, they, uh, prior to becoming a duo, Hardy was actually the Tin Man in the silent version of Wizard of Oz prior to uh, Talkies. Yes. And he, a lot of the munchkins were the same munchkins that then did the um, uh, Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland. 
Yeah, the, um, the, the, cre the reason I was asking about the um, Babes in Toyland, I wanted to know about the Walt Disney connection that he allowed them to use the uh, three little pigs. They they used uh, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf. They had a, uh, a Mickey Mouse, which is basically a, a, a monkey in a uh, Mickey Mouse outfit, um, which um, Disney today, you would never get away with using all that. But his relationship with Stan and Ollie must have been close enough for him to allow it. Yeah. Well, and then you also have, while well, Stan was Charlie Chaplin's understudy, Dick Van Dyke was Stan's understudy. In in what regard? And in, in as far as like on the um, theater lot, as oh. far as on the movie lot, Dick Van Dyke actually understudied Stan. Wow. When they were doing sound films? When they were doing sound films, yeah. Interesting. See that? You learn something every day. I remember uh, Dick Van Dyke doing an, uh, an interview and he mentioned that um, on his TV show, on the Dick Van Dyke show, he did a salute to Stan and Ollie. And uh, he couldn't wait to talk to Stan to see what his reaction was. And all Stan said is, you move too fast. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's so, right. And Van this, Dyke, yeah. yeah, and this is our section on just um, items that we have. Those are records of all of their um, soundtracks right there. Mm -hmm. And then if you look here on the very top shelf in the center case is part of our um, book collection on San and Ollie. And then we also have on the very bottom shelf some more and then we have another we have another whole set in the archives wow i was asking about um before we went on the air if you had uh any information uh john mccabe um back in the i guess it was in the 60s he got to befriend stan and he did an entire book called mr uh Laurel and Mr. Hardy. And then he did a follow-up book called Babe, all about Oliver Hardy's life. He also did one just on Stan as well. The McCabe books, Kate. Yeah, they're fairly good, to my understanding. Um, of course, nothing written by anybody but them is going to be fairly accurate. Although it's really odd if you actually look at Charlie Chaplin's autobiography, he doesn't really mention Stan, but Stan mentions him a lot. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's it's kind of an odd thing. Um, of course, Charlie, while funny, wasn't really known to be that affection of a man. Right. Or yeah. verbose, so. Very aloof. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you so, have a, Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so he, w he was kind of aloof. He wasn't a very affectionate man. He wasn't very verbose, so that may be why he didn't really mention Stan in his memoirs. Right. You have some paintings uh, behind you, um, a Stan... No, that's mostly Ollie there. These golfing ones? Yeah. Yep. So let me take you over to the curation stand and then we'll take you into the back room. Before we leave this area, was there anything else you guys wanted to have a close up of? Yeah, what's that car in the background? Oh. Oh, that would actually be a, uh, that is a fully wooden car. <clears throat> it is made from, it is made by Gary Russeth, <coughs> excuse me, who actually lives here in town. 
he um, makes replica automobiles out of completely out of wood. Everything on the car, including the engine and tires, is made from wood with the exception of the rubber on the horn, the vinyl on the seat, and the plastic in front of the light. Everything else that you see is wood. You can almost, Nudge. You can almost, Nudge. Yeah, Try yeah. and show you an underpiece of this mirror. I don't know if it's going to show up, but it's going to show you the undercarriage here of this car. All right, keep going down a little bit more. There you, there you go. Okay. Wow. You could almost hear um, Ollie singing out fresh fish. Uh huh. <laughs> so. So. Now, I think it was uh, Larry Harmon who was uh, Bozo the Clown on television, bought the rights to Stan and Ollie's likeness, and pretty much everything goes through his company. Yes. Yeah. So then we have our 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 take your take your picture of Stan and Ollie here. And we have one other car model out front. And we have another car model out front, which we'll 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 take you by before we end the the meeting. What's the quilt behind you on the wall? Okay, so this is actually made by our students here in um Harlem for the uh, anniversary, 200th anniversary of the county. And um, it is made with the old die types. The children made um, all of the squares and then the parents and teachers helped them uh, quilt it together. Are Stan and Ollie represented on there? Um, Ollie's on here somewhere. Oh, so there have been a few questions as to how did the um, how did the museum wind up in Georgia? Okay, so there's actually two, uh, three museums. Okay, if you look three down on the top of the quilt, there's Ollie. Oh, there he yeah. is. Yep. Okay, so um, Ollie was born here in Harlem, um, and actually right up about a block and a half and around the corner was his, um, was the house he was born in. There's a, actually a marker there now. The, um, so that's how the, the museum ended up here in this town in Georgia. There's also a museum in Olverston, England where um, Stan was born. There is another one in Germany because there is a huge, huge following of Stan and Ollie in Germany. And there, for some reason, and we're all kind of interconnected in a way, we at least keep in contact with one another, but in, there is a random one somewhere in Buenos Aires. Nobody really knows anything about it. <laughs> it's wow. just that we, we know it exists only because um, a couple of our patrons have been there and have told us about it, but we've never been able to contact it and they've never contacted us. <laughs> wow. Katie, do you have a favorite Lola and Hardy movie? I kind of like, I like the music box. I find it funny. I like yeah, that's my vote as well. That's my vote as, vote as well. Yeah, I love so, the music box. I actually like the county hospital. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm the camera person back here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one a lot of people forget about. And I think part of the reason I like it so much is that we actually, it's one of our rotation pieces. So I see it all the time. We'll take you guys into the theater here in a few minutes and show you some of the um, poster clips up on the walls. All right, let's do that. Next you, the what course. kind of audiences do you get, Katie? So we actually get a lot of international audiences because um, we get a lot of people in from India and Pakistan, and then we get a lot of Europeans. 
because there's still a huge audiences in those countries. Um, and then we do get actually quite a bit of Americans, but they're all far flung. Uh, um, many of them are getting older um, and they're either coming to reminisce themselves or they're coming to introduce their kids or grandkids into Laurel and Hardy. And how are the kids responding to it? A lot of, especially if they're coming in before they hit about age 12, they absolutely love it. Um, some of the teenagers aren't paying enough attention to care. Right. But um, if they're coming in before they hit those teenage years, they love it. And what, what film do you show them that gets the best response? Um, the Sailors. The Sailors. Um, they love The Sailors. They actually really love... Um, Two Tars? Huh? Two Tars, is that the name of it? Mm, I honestly don't. Men of War. Men of yes, Men of War. Okay. Thank you um, again, Richard. <laughs> um, and they also really love. Um, they also really love the one that Henry the 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 one where he's running for mayor. Yes. And the women are fighting. They find it hilarious. Yes. <laughs> the one where he's. Did you hear that? Yeah, we heard it. Thank you, Tiffany. You, know, you can turn the camera on yourself so we can see you talking. We have no problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have, before, I know we're going to go into, uh, you have somewhere else to take us, but Dirk very politely raised his hand with a question. And he would like to know, uh, does, is anybody familiar with where did the phrase, that's another fine mess you've gotten me into, come from? Oh, actually, it's on our catchphrases board. Bring them on over. So they never actually say there's another five minutes. Um, you, Can you guys see this? Yeah, it's, it's yep, tiny. Yep. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So he never actually uses that um, phrase. The closest that um, he actually gets to saying it is here's another nice mess. I've gotten you into uh, in, in a couple of movies, actually. So, but it just, for whatever reason, it's kind of like that Star Wars quote that happens um, that comes out of uh, Empire Strikes Back. Luke, I am your father. He oh. actually never says that either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's actually sprinkled through a couple of movies, items that are close to that. But so it's the title of the movie, Another Fine Mess. Um, where Katie's talking about, here's another nice mess I've gotten you into. That comes from Chickens Come Home. And then also is, well, here's another nice bucket of suds you've gotten me into is said in Saps at Sea. Uh-huh. All right. Oh, Dirk respond. Thank you very much. He even gives a smiley face. <laughs> I, even, uh, I recall um, reading that Stan was not pleased having to do the crying bit. It was something that he was not very fond of. No. Which not turn the light on. Okay. Which was which is really um, funny because he was he wasn't really fond of it, but once he'd done it the one time, he was kind of stuck with it. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, not easy. We've talked about it. Everybody said, everybody said you got to do it. It's funny you got to do it anyway. And he, so he said, "Okay." Oh, somebody new popped in. That yep. was Tiffany. She was grabbing my keys. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've talked about uh, crying routines. Do you in. have anything of theirs? Um, any personal belongings? Anything that was owned by Stan and Ollie? Um, not at the moment. We've got a couple of um, people that are talking about um, sending stuff our way that is in uh, people's personal um, collections. Such as? Um, we, we haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. What we have is they're... My father is now deceased, and we want to send you their 
Yeah. Their collection. Okay. Uh -huh. And we know they have some stuff from. So, uh, but this is our theater right here. And on the walls, we have actual um, posters from their. And we actually have a lot of the Spanish and German language posters. Um, from their movies. Katie, why do you think they're still so beloved after all these years? They're, they're looked upon differently than other comedy teams. Well, it's because while they were absolutely funny, they really... It, they were not... Um, they didn't disparage anybody by doing it. Does that make, they were very clean in their comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, and they didn't make fun of anybody really but themselves. Um, and so their comedy actually lasts over time. If that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Because there's not even any one bit that you can look at and say, well, that didn't, that doesn't translate. I have to pull that piece out because it's no longer appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, uh, a shame because if you really look at the history of comedy, We've always had comedy teams going back to like 1910. Uh, we had um, uh, Smith and Dale, who were the uh, prototype for the uh, Sunshine Boys that Neil Simon wrote about. Uh, then you get into the 1920s, and that's when Lowell and Hardy really start in silent films. Uh, in the 30s, you've got Burns and Allen. You've got uh, the Marx Brothers. You go into the 40s. It's the height of Abner and Costello. You go into the 50s. Here come... Um, Martin and Lewis and uh, uh, still, uh, um, uh, um, uh, geez, I'm going ahead of myself here. Uh, you go into the 60s, there's Rowan and Martin and you got the Smothers Brothers. But once you hit the 70s, there's like a dead end. You just run out of comedy teams. It just ends. It's, it's a lost art having two people. We still have it on TV shows where you can pair people up together and they work. But the idea of a team building themselves the way all of these uh, great uh, performers did, you know, people ask, how do they get the tie twiddle? How do they get the pulling on the hair? And these are all bits of business that they did over years and years and perfected so that by the time we saw them on the screen, those were characters that you could identify with. Exactly. So, and this is the theater itself. Wow. And then the film that's playing currently, this is the one where they sign up as Legionnaires, I believe. Oh. Wait. Nope, I'm sorry. This is the one where they're on the train with the cello. <laughs> <laughs> right. Birthmarks. Birthmarks, right. There we go. There's two scenes in there, and I always get them confused, so I have to wait and see whether they got stuck together or not. Yeah. So, and we are headed to, okay, so what this is, is we come up here, we're coming up to the curation station. Um, that is actually an item I just fixed that's getting ready to go back into the uh, um, archive. But, so... Well, one of the things that we found when we moved was because everything had been out in the old museum, that items were deteriorating. So we have a whole bunch of items that are getting ready to be fixed uh, and, and go back into the uh, into storage. And so I rotate those items out. I have them um, marked in the collections as needing repair. And so um, you can also, if she'll show you, see the other items on my table for um, that need to be worked on. So, so those are some of the historical items. There's a Stan Laurel badge here from 
Oh, no, it's not in English. I can't read it at the moment. <laughs> so. So those are the things that I'm working on repairing at, at, at this moment um, to go through and go back into the archives. And I'm going to take you back. In, are there back any in, descendants of uh, either Stan or Ollie that are still with us? Uh, um, well, um, Stan's daughter had a child and has grand and um, she has grandchildren, so they are still around. Um, Ollie never had an official child. Um, there are rumors on and off as to whether there was one out of wedlock, um, but nothing has ever been, no one has ever actually come forward as that child. So the rumors are the rumors are the rumors. Um, so, but nobody's ever actually claimed to be a descendant of Ollie himself. So now, those, those grandchildren that you mentioned, you mentioned, do they have any interest in what you're doing here? Um, not stands. They may be interested in what they do in Ulverston because that's their just their line. Um, but um, the. Um, now, the Hardy family in general has descendants here in Harlem. And have they visited you? Yeah, they come in all the time. Okay. So. Do any of them bear a resemblance to uh, Ollie? Um, we actually haven't seen any of the gentlemen. It's usually the girls that come in and they don't really look like him. <laughs> wow, interesting. There's always family back there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Darren, do we have any other questions from our guests? I know they're so inquisitive. I see them popping up. Yeah, we were asking about um, if there was a great granddaughter. They were just talking about that. Yes, there's a great granddaughter and a great grandson. There's a picture. She's going to go show it to you. Oh, okay. And oh. also, Pop, did you see we did a uh, Who is Your Favorite Comedy Team? Yeah. You want to go over that? Yeah, obviously, Laurel and Hardy took... Oh, there we go. There are the grandchildren and granddaughter. Wow. So this is the daughter. Here's the granddaughter. And then these are the grandchildren. So this is Stan's great-grandchildren here, guys. Wow. Tiffany, uh, did you have an interest in, in uh, Stan and Ollie before you took this job? Um, I actually grew up watching these guys. I grew up in a very um, small town with PBS, and this is what I got to watch on Saturdays. Or I would turn PBS on, and if they were doing comedy shows, it'd be these guys. Um, so this is something I've kind of grown up with. I'm a historian myself, um, and I like the clean comedy and it's cultural comedy that's continued to grow and you can still find a lot of interest with it. That's what I like about a lot of the cultural teams. I didn't know near as much about these guys until I started working out here and getting into these archives. And some of the things in our archives are kind of scary <laughs> and kind of creepy. I'll, I'll give you that. So I'm, I'm gonna back up just a little bit guys. So hopefully you can actually see how much we have in our storage room. And we're out of storage again, guys. Okay, so we have 14 foot ceilings just to give you a, a hint. And literally these shelves go from floor to ceiling. Um, this first very section is what we call specials and the actual archives. Um, and the blue boxes, the blue boxes are things like um, documentations and um, letters. letters and uh, memos and all of those types of things. One of the few things that we do have that is original that's not out on the floor yet, just because I haven't figured out how to um, Display. Uh, make it uh, safe for um, exhibition is we do have very old um, 
Hal wrote Studios phone books that have um, Laurel and Hardy's names in them. So that is one original piece that we do have, but I'm not putting it out till I figure out how to do it without it disintegrating. Is there <laughs> something that you consider the most important or your favorite piece in the entire collection? In the entire collection? Yeah. You have a lot of boxes there. Tiffany, you as well. Yeah, and um, I don't you know what, Tiffany, while you're there, can you just slide one of those boxes out and just whip off the cover and let us see what you're Yeah, hang on, let's let me find one that I don't have a bunch of stuff on display. Hang on. Not that one. <laughs> no. Okay. okay. Okay, back to you, Katie. What's your favorite? Okay, so one of my favorites that we have. Okay, so this is a box of books. Okay, so this is what's in like an archive box. The John McKay book, yeah, babe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what goes in an archive box along with documents and stuff like this. Documents, uh, an archive box is papers and documents and things like that, books, etc. Which one has all the letters in it? Do you remember? Not off the top of my head. Um, a. Um, mm, Many moons ago, I had the uh, good fortune of meeting John McCabe, and I asked him the difference between Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy. Um, there was always this uh, uh, competition between them. I don't know if you've heard about that, but uh, Stan always felt that Lou Costello was stealing some of his material. What's all that? Okay, so the, if, if you look in a uh, regular box, what you're going to see is something like this. Okay, so this is actually a Hardy um, music box. This bottom section is going to be a music box, and this is going to be a little Hardy figurine that turns around and around. Okay, this one's going to be its match as a stand. Do you know how many you how old it is? So uh, these are from the '60s. Yeah, those are going to be from the '60s. Um, you're going to have plates, porcelain dolls in here. Okay. So that's what a, a, a properly packaged box is going to look like that doesn't need. Um, Try and find one that like our toy box. It doesn't, isn't real wrapped. So you guys were asking me what my favorite piece is. Yes. I don't have a favorite piece. I have a least favorite piece. Okay. okay? And it is this absolutely creepy Ollie rockabye toy. It's red. It's a big ball with Ollie's head on it. And it sounds like the creepy killer clown music when it goes off. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate this piece. Where, uh, yeah. Where, okay. Is that uh, stored away? Um, we have an extra out on the front. The other one's stored away. And I'm trying to remember what box I stored it in. But as you can tell, we've stored a lot of boxes, guys. How, <laughs> so, okay. how often do you rotate the exhibitions? We will rotate about every quarter or so. Um, oh, we can show you up on this side. So these are our other specials over there. Things that are just too big to go in boxes. Okay. Katie, I can't thank you enough on this because we never get the opportunity to go behind the scenes to see how a museum is put together like this. So as you guys can see, a lot of these are statuettes. Um, what you guys can see here, can you guys see these bottles? Yeah, those are okay. bottles? They're beer bottles, guys. Wow. So With the beer still in them. Yep. <laughs> we have a lot of handmade handmade crafts and all sorts of stuff as well yeah so my favorite, my favorite items are, are some of the handmade crafts and i say some of them because some of them are um very scary very very scary so like here is a bunch of handmade stuff that we are still trying to figure out how to archive guys Yep. Wow. There were questions as why isn't this on display? You just have so much material here. Uh, Correct. Unbelievable. 
Um, so even like this piece, this piece came down off display six months ago, and it'll probably be two to three years before it goes back on display in the rotation. Just because we just have so much. So much. And wow. so, so much, guys. Um, this is one of our bigger pieces. We love, um, we love this piece. It's beautiful. Which one and, is there? Oh, wow. Was this done by a local artist or? This is done by John William Willard. Something like that. It's marked in the bottom corner. Okay. Um, it's one of our very few oil paintings that we have of this size that is done well. We have some really good stuff, guys. We've got some really kind of not so good, scary stuff. All of this, this entire rack that I'm on right now with Katie, this is all just Oliver and Hardy framed pictures, guys. This isn't our historical stuff. This is just Ollie and Hardy, Ollie and Stan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I'm going to give you Katie for one. a second, and I'm going to see if I can find one of the pieces I'm talking about. Okay. So this over here is primarily history with a couple of Laurel and Hardy carryovers but this one over here is pretty much lauren i can give you one right here oh this one <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of like and this is actually a good version of some of the stuff we have we have other pieces in here that we really it took us a while to identify what it was supposed to be mm -hmm. And that will probably never ever see the light of day. Ever again. <laughs> Katie, Katie Oliver, Oliver, uh, Oliver's name was Oliver Norville Hardy. Yes. And Stanley Jefferson uh, Laurel, is that correct? Well, he, okay, so Ollie was, was born. Um, uh, just, another hand, just another hand piece, guys. So Ooh. this is something, we have all sorts of stuff like this. In our archives. Wow. And then we rotate what um, is. I've got mirrors. I've got. Identifiable and good. And we. So. You were saying about uh, his name. So Stan was actually born as Arthur Stanley Jefferson. And then he originally, when he was with um, Frank's. Uh, Corners group. He was under the name of um, Stan Jefferson, and then when he was with May Dahlberg, um, she, she came up with the name Stan Laurel, and that's when he became Stan Laurel. Okay, excellent. There, there was a question: uh, how how did we uh, how did he get the nickname Babe? It was one of the, it's one of those nicknames that comes about. Um, because of his size. Huh. Mm -hmm. I think I know the answer to that. May I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Florida, there was a, a barber shop and the barber thought his face was so cute and light colored like a baby. He started to call him Babe. I and hope you all appreciate that. All right. Thank this you. This is the one that uh, she hates. <laughs> <laughs> so if it slipped out of your hand right now, you wouldn't feel terrible. That's the... <laughs> no, this one's actually broken, so it's not as bad. Wow. The one that's in the archive actually has... The painting is still all on it and all of that. And you can kind of hear the chimes in this one, but <laughs> you can tell it's broken. The one that's actually buried in the archival box still sings at you. And it is that creepy e e e e e e clown music. And it, I can't stand it. <laughs> that's going to be the hot uh, holiday gift next Christmas. That's going to be it. <laughs> okay. um, Do you have a gift shop that you can take us yep. to? Yep. Let's go up here to the gift shop and we will, uh, we and will, uh, 
And friends, before we get into the gift shop, we should acknowledge the gift shop is not online. It's in person, but uh, but Katie and Tiffany, they're able to ship anything to you. So if you are interested, you can always give them a call at the museum and order something that way. And they can answer any questions you may have that we don't have time to get to today. Yeah, yeah, I know we're already over. We're already over an hour. Um, I apologize. This is, we're always running long, but it's so worth it. Oh, here's the other uh, the other car. This is the other car. It is set up as a photo op where you can sit right back there or stand right back there and look like you are taking a photograph with Stan and Ollie. Oh, that's great. So this is our gift shop right here. So we have festival t-shirts, um, Harlem hats. We have uh, festival hats and just museum caps. So we were talking earlier about the eyes, guys. I'm gonna try and show you this picture real quick. Yeah. And if you look at Stan's eyes, you can really kind of see how they were not showing up correctly. <laughs> so uh, we have pictures like this. We have uh, short volumes. We have t-shirts. Um, you were talking about descendants earlier. One of the family cousins made these t-shirts for us this year because we had to cancel our annual festival. And this is the back of this t-shirt, guys. Oh. <laughs> uh, we have mugs, hat pins, keychains. Tea koozies. Was there a calendar? Somebody said there was a calendar. I do not have a calendar. I have Christmas balls. <laughs> I've got mugs. Very nice. Hat pins, tea koozies, couple of postcards. What kind of hours do you keep over there? Um, we are 10 to 4 Monday through Saturday, other than major holidays. Mm -hmm. Katie, what, what is the festival like each year? Okay, so each year on the first Saturday in October is the festival. It usually runs from about 9 till 6 p.m.-ish. Um, we have all kinds of vendors. The entire downtown area shuts down. We have vendors. We have entertainment. We have um, impersonators. We have a parade that starts everything off. Um, it's just a huge event. Um, up until we had to cancel this last year, but previous years we had upwards of twenty to 30,000 people that inundated this small little town. <laughs> oh, my it, goodness. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's a huge thing. And it, uh, we have both national and international visitors. We we have people that come from all over. And we have a, a testimonial. Dottie says it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's wonderful. You know, Pop, when we when we went to the It's a Wonderful Life Museum, we were talking about visiting for their festival. Maybe next year, this is how we have to travel the states. We need to follow the festivals. Absolutely. When do you yeah. have your festival, um, Katie? First Saturday in October. Okay. Yeah. When was It's a Wonderful Life? December? Um, uh, yeah. Right? That's right. The first week. So, of the yeah. These are actual pieces that we also have on sale. This is... I hate her camera. This is one piece that we have by Mr. Caulfield. It's actually signed by the artist. And then these are pieces that we have two or three of them extra in the collection. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, wow. Wow. I had those. <laughs> so these are also for sale, other than my fishing boat in the corner, guys. He is not for sale. And my puppy's not for sale either. <laughs> Can we um, see one of the tea cozies? There was a, Jilly was asking for the tea cozy. <laughs> there you go. And then as you guys come in, we're in an old theater. In like the cutout where you used to buy your tickets, we have big Stan and Laurel life-size type pieces. So Stan's on the inside and Ollie's on the outside. 
It might get real loud real quick, but I'll show you. <laughs> Wow, very cool. So. Katie, Tiffany, we can't thank you enough. This was a real treat. Uh, there are so many fans out here that really love these two guys, and it's going to go on forever. There's no question. Okay. So, but yeah, so this has been fun. This is pretty much our little place here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so thank you so much thank you so everybody if you would like to get some more information about the about the museum you can go here harlem museum and welcomecenter.com and that's where you can find out more information about laurel and hardy and i'm sure they'll have information about the festival when that's back up and running um, you can also of course contact if you'd like to pick up any of those items follow them over on facebook you can see them here and I like they had one uh, posting <laughs> for Psycho. We just did our Psycho lecture a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I was happy to see that. You can also follow Sal on Facebook, of course. We're live on Facebook right now. So thank you for all of you watching over there. You can also see this recording and all of Sal's other virtual road trips at Sal St. George on YouTube. Go ahead, check out the playlist and we have his virtual road trips listed for you. As always, you can sign up for all of Sal's programs at salstgeorge.com. Coming up next week, we are going to the Clark Gable Museum, another virtual road trip, our third road trip in a row. So this is, this is great for us. We love this. And you can also see later in the month, we have the boys from Brooklyn. We have a Coney Island story. So many programs coming up for you to choose from. We hope you stop by. And always, and you can start your Monday mornings. We have our own mugs now. You can pick up your virtual road trip mug to begin your week. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Tiffany. You're welcome. Thank you.